Welcome to another edition of The Trainer. Today's topic, diagnosing system lean and system rich DTCs. That's coming up next, stick around. The PO171 and PO174 generic DTCs, that is the system lean DTCs, are among the top 10 diagnostic trouble codes that technicians have to face on a routine basis. How do these occur? Well, any time that the ECM's additions to fuel control are beyond what the program threshold is in the software, well, then that code will set. In other words, if they're having to make additional corrections to the base fuel trim calculations, uh, then that's what's gonna cause these codes to set. Now, the other side of the coin is the system rich. And that's when the base fuel calculations are having to be subtracted from in order to maintain fuel control. And if any of that stuff that I just said to you does not make any sense, well, I want you to go back and take a look at the trainer number 65, where we talk about fuel trims and how they, uh, what they mean, what they do, and how the ECM calculates those. So we're gonna focus on diagnosing these two codes and uh, provide some helpful tips and techniques that might make finding the solutions to these problems a little easier for you. Let's start off talking a little bit about the system lean DTCs first, okay? Uh, the same is gonna apply to system rich, but in reverse, right? What I wanna focus on here in the beginning is making sure everyone understands what we mean by fuel control, when the ECM is in fuel control. Now, in my definition, in my mind, Fuel control is established when the ECM is able to uh, see a constant feedback from the oxygen sensor that's staying right around the middle of its range. In other words, it's constantly switching back across zero, across that, that 0 0.450 uh, millivolt range. And we know that the content, the air fuel ratio that's being fed to the engine is correct. Now, if it starts to stay on the high side, where we're looking at uh, too little oxygen, the rich condition, or the low side where too much oxygen or a lean condition, well then the ECM is going to try to correct for that to get it back to the middle. Now, how is it doing that? Well, it's getting a measurement of the air and there's two, there's two ways that can happen that we'll discuss in a moment. And then once it knows how much air is going to the engine, it calculates the amount of fuel to add to get that proper ratio. And it's doing so under a few assumptions. The fuel pressure feeding the injectors has to be the specification the ECM is, is expecting, and the flow rate that the injectors are providing has to be with that, within that ECM expectation. If neither one are, then the amount of fuel passing through at that calculated pulse width, that injector pulse width, is not going to be correct, is it? Uh, imagine a leaking injector, for example. The pulse width calculation may be correct for the amount of air coming in. But because we have leaking injectors, the amount of fuel is skewed. It's not meeting the expectations that the ECM is expecting, is it? Uh, same is true if we have a restriction in the fuel system, say a low volume supply or, or a clog injector. The pulse weight may be correct, but the amount of fuel being entered is skewed because it's not at specification. So the, both of these conditions can cause the system lean, system rich codes that we're gonna troubleshoot. What I want you to get in your mind is, it's not so much about adding fuel or taking away fuel. You have to keep in mind that maybe that's not right to begin with, and you have to eliminate that as a possibility. Now, if you've been tracking our videos for any length of time, you know one of the very first things that I encourage people to do when they're tackling any kind of diagnostic trouble code is to be familiar with the conditions uh, and the criteria that the ECM is looking at in order to set that code. In other words, how is the ECM testing the system to see if it's working the way it's supposed to, to see whether or not it should set that code? Now, in the case of system lean and system rich uh, codes, the ECM is watching what its trim corrections are. And if it continuously has to add a correction due to a seen lean condition or take away a correction because of a seemingly rich condition, it's going to continue to do so, trying to get that back in center, as I said earlier, but if it reaches a certain threshold, 
whatever the engineers programmed into it, and this will vary from make to make, if it reaches that threshold and still can't get that fuel system under control, well, that's what's gonna cause the code to set. So we know what the computer is looking at, and that's how we can also base our tests. So once we understand what the ECM is looking for, we can construct our own tests to mimic what the ECM is doing in order to find uh, the cause and correct it. Now, the other thing I wanna point out when you're getting ready to tackle these codes is to make sure that you look at the freeze frame data. Take a look at that freeze frame data. Because these are constantly monitored codes, constantly monitored situations, uh, we need to know what conditions the vehicle was operating under when the code set. For example, if you have a system lean code at idle, cold, that could point to a different cause than a system lean at high cruise under a high load. Same with the system reg codes. So it's very vitally important that you don't clear anything, you don't disconnect anything, you don't clear that freeze frame data until you've had a chance to review it, maybe write it down, take a snapshot of it, whatever you need to do so that you can go back and see exactly what the conditions were when the code set. Now there is one scan tool on the market, the Automotive Test Solutions scan tool that has this test built in, actually lays it out in a graph so that you can see when these conditions occur. Another thing that you can do is to perform um, just a routine test drive, set up your own route, one you can use for every vehicle that you take, that allows you to drive that vehicle under a variety of conditions. Uh, idle, highway, cruise, a uh, section where you can actually do a wide open throttle test and graph that information with your scan tool that you can go back to the shop and review that in more detail. Common graph items that you would want to uh, uh, include, PIDs that you would include, RPM. Uh, engine temperature, um, intake temperature, short and long-term fuel trims for both banks, of course, and uh, MAF sensor is so equipped, uh, what that reading is, and uh, calculated load or the load PID. Uh, these are all items that you can use to help you determine what kind of issues are going on and what the causes might be. Now, before you can be successful in diagnosing system lean or system rich codes, there's one more thing you need to understand, and that's the type of system that you're working on. Are you working on a speed density system or are you working on a mass airflow system? Uh, we'll talk about the speed density system here in a moment. Probably still the most common is the mass airflow system. Um, this actually started overcoming the speed density uh, over the last several years because of what the MAF sensor is capable of doing. It can actually measure the quantity of air without any calculations necessary by the ECM. So we provide this direct input for the amount of air. We have an exact number. We have a, a reliable figure to use. Now the ECM can move right onto its fuel calculations and, and just take care of that. But Sensors don't always tell the truth, do they? If you've been doing any kind of uh, drivability diagnostics for any length of time, you've probably run into more than one situation where the sensor was the culprit because it was lying to the ECM. MAF sensors are no different. Uh, they can also be the source of misinformation rather than correct information. Um, as they age, uh, the numbers may be skewed. Uh, if the film or hot wire elements become contaminated, that's going to skew the figures. Uh, and there's a couple of ways that you wanna uh, check to make sure that the MAF is reporting correctly. Probably the easiest is performing a volumetric efficiency test. That's where you take data from the road test that we mentioned earlier. You plug it into a VE calculator and you find out what the VE rating of the engine is. Uh, that's a topic really for another time. But uh, lots of information already online, motorage.com if you wanna learn more. That's one way you can find out if the MAF sensor is telling the truth or not. And certainly like any other sensor, it's got to have good power and grounds so we can check those uh, with our DVOM and make sure that is correct if we suspect that we're getting a misreporting from that sensor. Now that's not the only way that we can get misinformation to the computer. What if we open a back door to the engine? What if there's a tear in the intake boot or a leak in the intake gasket or a cracked vacuum line, anything like that that's allowing air into the engine and it's not passing through the MAF sensor? We call that unmetered air. And what the result is, is there's air being added to the engine that the ECM doesn't know about. Well, it's basing its fuel calculation based on what the mass sensor told it, isn't it? So any air that we add additionally is going to cause that overall mixture to become lean. And then you're gonna start seeing those positive corrections uh, from the ECM in an attempt to bring that back to center. Um, vacuum leaks are not always the easiest to spot. Uh, sometimes they're hidden, sometimes they can be internal. 
Uh, best thing I would advise you to use is your smoke machine to uh, hook that up to the intake and help you locate the sources of, of those types of leaks. Now, how do you know if it's a vacuum leak and not something else? Well, first, freeze frame data is going to indicate that the issue is at idle or very low speed. Why? Because there's very little air going in the engine already, isn't there? So when we add any additional air, it has more of an impact than what does, say, if we're cruising down the highway at, at 80 miles an hour. Uh, one way you can check very easily is to watch the fuel trims at idle. Of course, they're probably going to be correcting weight positive, and then bring the engine speed up to about 2,500 RPM. Let it stabilize for a minute. If you see the fuel trims trying to get back down to a more normal, or they are at a more normal level, well, there you go. That's one of the greatest indications that you have some source of unmetered air vacuum leak getting into the engine and causing your system lean uh, on a MAP equipped system. Now, speed density systems were in common use uh, back in the early days of OBD and OBD2. Um, and then, like I said, the, the MAP sensors kind of started taking over because of the simplicity and the ability of that sensor to directly measure the airflow. But now we're seeing a lot of OEMs, they're going to turbocharge power plants and the speed density system is once again making its way onto the scene. Now, this, as I mentioned, the speed density system relies uh, on a variety of sensors, primarily the manifold absolute pressure or MAP sensor to provide inputs to the ECM that it then uses to calculate how much air is coming in. And as I said already on the other systems, if there's a problem with any of the sensors providing these inputs, then of course there's going to be an issue with that calculation and that could be the cause of your system lean or system rich codes. Uh, some of the other things with the MAP sensor, uh, we talked about vacuum leaks. Vacuum leaks will really have no impact on fuel trims. They won't be the cause of a system lean code on a MAP system. Why? Because whatever vacuum leaks are getting into that intake manifold, the MAP sensor is going to see that. Uh, more commonly, what you'll see is a higher than normal idle speed. It's an idle speed you can't quite get under control uh, because there is air getting into the engine that's not going through the throttle plate. So that's one thing you want to keep a look out of. Okay, before we go with this episode of the trainer, there's a few other things I want to leave you with when you're diagnosing system lean, system rich codes that I've seen techs overlook. Number one is the fuel delivery system. You know. As I said right at the very beginning, the ECM can only calculate how much fuel to add, the pulse width specifically for that injector, if the injector flow rate is as it should be, and the volume of fuel being delivered, and the pressure it's being delivered at is as it should be. So we're all taught to check fuel pressure, but how many of you are making a routine check of fuel volume? That's vitally important, and usually what you'll see is conditions that occur um, when it starts to sputter or kick or fuel trims start to go lean when the system's operating uh, at higher speeds or under heavy, a heavier load, certainly not at idle when fuel demand is low. Another common thing that is becoming more and more reported is issues with alcohol content of the fuel, especially if you're over in the corn belt. Uh, there's two conditions that typically happen. We have the vehicle that is not designed to run on ethanol that ends up getting filled up with ethanol. And because of the higher oxygen content, uh, the system actually has to make positive corrections uh, in order to try to get that oxygen sensor where it wants to see it. Uh, another very common is uh, some flex fuel vehicles that are driven short distances, use a variety of fuel, whether ethanol, conventional gasoline, and never really get to get a handle, uh, at least the ECM doesn't, on exactly what's in the tank and is trying to burn. So one of the things you want to check is the alcohol content PID on the enhanced data of your scan tool. If you see that kind of out of whack, you know, somewhere in the middle, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent rather than 85 or 10, then, then that may be an indication that the ECM's confused. And if it's running conventional gasoline, but it thinks it's running on alcohol, well then you can have a system lean condition because uh, uh, the computer is just factoring in the wrong type of fuel. So make sure you check that as well. Actually checking alcohol content is probably not a bad thing to do as a part of your routine system lean, system rich diagnosis, just to help eliminate that as a possibility. And it's not hard to do. There are kits on the market that will allow you to do that uh, very specifically, where you can exactly tell exactly how much alcohol content's in the fuel. But again, as a quick troubleshooting aid, I just wanna know, is that PID on that vehicle uh, correct? I might, do I have a high alcohol content in this tank? Or is it lying? 
uh, is it being uh, misinforming the ECM? So let me show you a really quick way that you can do that. And all you need is, uh, is a glass jar, uh, some water, and a sample of the fuel. Okay, to do this little test, like I said, there are kits that you can get. You can get a graduated beaker or baby bottle from the local store. Uh, and you can do these tests more detailed so you can tell exactly what the alcohol content again is. But again, Mike, I just want to know if I'm dealing with a flex fuel vehicle that's giving me a 50 or 60 percent alcohol content, uh, but I suspect that the system lean condition is being caused by uh, a PID that's not correct, then, um, then I want to go really just do a really quick test to see whether I'm, I'm right or not. So all we're going to do is we're going to take a jar and I'm going to take some water and I'm just going to put a little bit in the jar. Maybe fill it up to about, I don't know, an inch at the bottom. Right about there. Now there's, uh, you, can, you probably can't see it as well on, on, the, on camera as I can. There's a little ridge on the jar there, but just to be on the safe side, I'm going to just mark, make a little permanent marker mark there. And then I'm going to take a fuel sample that I collected and I'm just going to pour that in to the jar on top of the water. Now, of course, the water and the, and the uh, gas are going to separate. But if there's any alcohol in the fuel, it's going to mix or be absorbed rather by the water. And that should cause the water level to rise. The more alcohol, the higher that rise should be. So we're just going to shake it up a little bit. I'm not quite a good tight seal there. And then I'm just going to let it sit and settle out. We'll come back in a couple of minutes and see what happened. Okay, as you can see on this particular sample, the, the water level, the base level, is still right about at where I marked it originally. Even if there's uh, as much as a 10%, the increase here may be marginal. Now, if this were E85, then we should see a marked increase. We should see that water level raising up even further as it absorbs the alcohol out of the gasoline. Uh, so again, let this sit, I'd say three to five minutes, let it get it nice and stable, check where you are. If we were like uh, doing the situation we talked about earlier, you know, we saw a, a out of whack pin on a flex fuel vehicle, uh, and then we wanted to make sure whether it was dealing, we had alcohol in the tank or we didn't, this is a quick way to tell. This is obviously uh, E10 or, uh, or just conventional gasoline. You know, most everything now has some alcohol in it, right? So um, again, this is just a quick test. You can do it more precisely if you want to, but I would make this a habit on every vehicle that you're doing a, a system uh, drivability or um, anything you think might be fuel, a fuel related issue, whether it's a system lean or system rich code. Well, that's going to about do it for this edition of The Trainer. I hope you found the tips helpful. I'll see you next month.